Hayes. He's been educating and advocating for plant-based diets and doing work to end animal suffering. He's the founder and president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Please welcome him to Well, thanks for uh, spending the morning with me. What a, what a great day this is going to be. Um, let's get started. We're going to talk about diabetes, but um, although we're focusing on that, everything else comes along with it because the same food habits that drive diabetes drive weight problems and heart problems and things, even a surprise against Alzheimer's disease. So our research is going to start looking at a group of Seventh-day Adventists. And when I started my research career, I couldn't figure out why Seventh-day Adventists are put under the microscope all the time. And of course, I figured it out. It's because they are almost entirely non-smokers, teetotalers, very health-conscious people, but they vary in diet. Some eat meat, some don't, so it's a fantastic natural experiment, and is it a good thing to get away from meat? So in 2009, the American Diabetes Association published these data. They looked at almost 61,000 Adventists, and they split them into groups according to the diets that they habitually follow. And what they looked at was body mass index. Is that familiar? Okay, it's, it's your weight adjusted for how tall you are. And a healthy BMI, we're going to say, is below 25. And so the line on the left, these are non-vegetarians. These are people who ate meat more or less every day. And they weren't below 25. They were at 28.8. And then the line next to them, these were people who were semi-vegetarian, meaning they ate meat but less than once a week. A little skinnier, not dramatically. Uh, the third group, pesco vegetarians, pesco is? Okay, so no meat other than fish. Uh, a little thinner, lacto-ovo vegetarians, lacto meaning dairy, ovo, eggs, okay. Um, but the only group that was really within the healthy weight range were people on a vegan diet. And if you happen to be dragged here by a friend, and that's just a new word for you. A vegan is not a person from the planet Vegas. It just means a, it means a person who doesn't eat animal products at all. And they were the skinniest people. But the reason that the American Diabetes Association published this was because of this. The meat eaters had a lot of diabetes. The vegans had a dramatically low risk of developing this disease. So my research team thought, well, that's cool. Let's put this to the test for people who don't have diabetes and, and are generally healthy, but they just want to lose some weight. So we brought in 64 overweight women. They had all tried the Atkins diet and the South Beach diet and Jenny Craig and Nutrisystem and cabbage soup and you name it, they've done it. Um, but what we asked them to do was to either begin a low-fat vegan diet or a conventional diet. And the conventional diet was a heart-healthy diet that was brought forward by the National Cholesterol Education Program. Uh, less red meat, more chicken, smaller meat portions in general, over the fat, that was the conventional approach. But the people on the plant-based diet uh, were, well, I'll tell you, there was no calorie limit. We didn't ask them to exercise or, or to change their exercise habits at all. We didn't give them anything to eat. They had to figure out what they were going to eat at home or at restaurants. And what we encouraged them to follow was what I call the power plate. So we're going to eat fruits and grains and vegetables and Legumes, what are legumes? Beans, pulses, yeah, beans, peas, lentils, things that grow in a pot, exactly. So our participants were horrified to discover what they could eat on this diet. Uh, pancakes, as long as there was no butter, they could eat all the pancakes they wanted to, and wouldn't that make me fat? Um, and linguine, as long as it didn't have the meat sauce, they could have all the linguine they wanted and so forth. And when we do these research studies, we never just hand people a, a diet sheet of paper and say, come back in three months. We always meet with them every week in a, like a support group. And the third week of this group, one of the participants said, Dr. Barnard, I found a treat that I can have on your low-fat vegan diet. I thought, uh-oh, I wonder what this is. And she opened her purse and she pulled out a pack of red licorice. She said, look at the label. And it's true. They're vegan. Um, it's just sugary, starchy, artificially colored junk. And she made sure that all my research participants knew that you could eat unlimited red liquid. <laughs> so despite these, um, these things, 
when we track their weight, uh, the average person lost about 5.8 kilograms over 14 weeks, uh, compared to a little under four in the control group. So they, they, did, they lost substantially more weight, despite the Twizzlers. And then when we looked at them two years later, the control group, their weight came back. But for the people on the plant-based diet, they were skinnier in a year than at the beginning. They were skinnier in two years than in one year. In other words, instead of making a quantitative change in your diet, it was a qualitative change. You're just eating different foods. So you're not hungry. You're not starving. And you stick with it, and, and the weight stays off. So why? Why is it that eating pancakes and linguine, people lose weight? Well, the first reason is that you're eating vegetables and fruits and beans and grains. They have fiber in them. Fiber has effectively no calories, but fiber fills you up. In fact, in your stomach, fiber holds some water with it. So you're going to think, whoa, did I eat a lot of food? The truth is you ate substantially less than when you're eating cheese or meat. The other thing is that fat has nine calories in a gram, and carbohydrate has only four. And I make all of our research participants memorize this, because all their friends say, carbs are fattening. You've heard this, right? Carbs have four calories. Carbohydrate has four calories. Even pure sugar has four calories in a gram compared with the fat from a chicken, salmon fat, cheese fat, even extra virgin olive oil, nine calories per gram. So when you're avoiding all that fat, you lose weight. Okay? The other thing is that we test our metabolism. And we test the metabolism in our participants by they lie down on the table and we cover their face with a plastic bubble. And we're measuring their oxygen intake. And if they're taking in a lot of oxygen and putting in a lot of carbon dioxide, that means they're, they're metabolizing more rapidly. Their, their cells are, are metabolizing. And it's 6 o'clock in the morning. They come into the laboratory. Their metabolism is very slow. We then give them breakfast. And their metabolism rises because they're absorbing nutrients. And then they go on a low-fat vegan diet, and they come back 14 weeks later. And we measure the metabolism in the same table, the same breakfast, except that their metabolism is now about 16% faster than it was before. A low-fat plant-based diet doesn't just reduce the calories that, you're, that are going in because all that fiber uh, is filling you up and there's not a lot of grease in it, but your metabolism is actually faster. When you get the fat out of your cells, they burn calories more like they did when they were 16 years old. Okay? So it's, it's the reason that vegans tend to be skinny. So our National Institutes of Health said, okay, let's test this for diabetes and see how it works. And so we brought in a large group of people and randomly assigned them to either a conventional diabetes diet or a plant-based diet. And the conventional diet meant don't eat so many calories. And if any of you have diabetes or have a loved one who has diabetes, you know what I'm talking about. Then you go see the dietitian, and the dietitian will say, well, we've got to cut calories, uh, cut 500 calories a day off of your, your menu. Here's what you're going to eat. By Wednesday, you are ready to eat the sofa. And, you know, how long do I have to keep this up? Because um, you're hungry every day. Um, they say, well, keep it up until you reach your ideal body weight, which is going to be never on this diet. Okay. The other thing is keep carbohydrates steady. So it's not low carb, but it's never having a lot of carbohydrate at any point in the day or in the week. And limit the bad fats, the animal fats, not too high. That's the conventional approach. So, but on a plant-based diet, there was no animal products. We kept oils very low. So we taught them non-oil cooking techniques. Um, how to negotiate with a waiter at an Italian restaurant. Okay. Um, <laughs> Low glycemic index foods. Now, this is not low carb. Uh, white bread is high glycemic index. What that means is it makes your blood sugar rise pretty fast. But rye bread is a little more gentle on your blood sugar. Pumpernickel, even more so. So it's, we're not getting into the carbs. We're just choosing the ones that are gentlest on my blood sugar. So those are the rules. Okay. So to cut to the chase, what we track is something called hemoglobin A1C. Is that familiar? Some of you, it's a measure of your blood sugar control. And if a person has diabetes, we want it to be below 7. And our folks were not below 7. They were at about 8 on average. And the red line is the people in the conventional <laughs> diet. And they had a good drop. They dropped about 0.4, which is great. 
If you have a medicine that does that, you're happy. But the blue line, are the, that's the people on the plant-based diet. They had a drop three times greater, like 1.2 absolute percentage points. If you had a medication that did that, invest everything you have in that medication because it's more powerful than any other medication. It's just called the simple dietary change. So this is Vance. Vance was a policeman in Washington. And he came in and he told us all about diabetes. He said, all up and down my family tree. It means you're going to lose a leg. Probably go blind. Vance's father was dead at age 30. Vance was 30, 31 when he was diagnosed with diabetes. Several years later, it was late 30s, he came in to see us. And he began the diet. And the first thing he said is he said, this diet's really easy. I said, what do you mean easy? People think of a vegan diet as kind of challenging. Um, he said, no, no, it's easy. Um, you don't know what diabetes diets are like. They make you count your carb grams and go to bed hungry and make sure you don't exceed their calorie limit. You don't even do any of that. It's just no meat chili, have bean chili. Like, how hard is that? Anybody could do it. So over about a year, he lost 60 pounds. He stopped his diabetes medications. His hemoglobin A1C had started at 9.5, which is terrible. But it became, it dropped to 5.3, which happens to be normal. I paced around in my office with his lab results in my hand for about 20 minutes, because he didn't have diabetes anymore. And back in 2003, when we started this study, you couldn't tell a patient they didn't have diabetes anymore. The, the whole word was, you got diabetes, and once you got diabetes, you will always have diabetes. And, and doctors would say that very emphatically, because they didn't want the patient to ever stop their medication. You got it, you'll have it for life. Here was a man on no medication with absolutely normal value. And of course, now, we've gotten totally used to it. Uh, diabetes is a two-way street. You can get rid of this disease. Now, cheese is waiting right around the corner, and so you can get the disease back. Um, but it's definitely a two-way street. Oh, by the way, when I was asking his clinician to share his results with you, he said, make sure you tell everybody that my erectile dysfunction went away, too. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a whole other lecture, but this happens routinely. And this has to do with blood flow to a man's private parts. When you narrow the arteries to any part of the body, you can have you got the idea. Okay. <laughs> um, this is Nancy. Nancy had a similar story. She lost 40 pounds um, over about a year. She stopped her medication. Her A1C fell, but it's still in the diabetic range. And the reason I point this out is for diabetes, you want to get to it early. Um, you don't want to wait until a person has had this disease for 25 years. Because if you do, it's harder and harder and harder to make it go away. You still do much better on a plant-based diet. But to make it go away, start when they're diagnosed or, frankly, Started at conception. Um, you know, if we can stop prevent this disease, that's a good thing to do. Um, interestingly enough, her her arthritis improved. She came running into our center saying, "My joints don't hurt anymore." Um, and that's another lecture as well. But autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, hypothyroidism, Sjogren's disease, eczema, very often get better when you get the dairy out of the diet and animal products in general. Okay, don't take this on faith. Try it if you have a child with asthma. Run. Do not walk to a completely vegan diet for that child and for all of us the family. In some cases, you're going to cure that child. Okay. All right. So let me show you my most important slide. I want to show you the cause of type 2 diabetes. This is a muscle cell, this blue thing, the muscle cell. The reason I'm showing you a muscle cell is that muscles are powered by glucose. The sugar that's in your blood is trying to get into that cell to power it. So sugar is good in your body, but it's just not good if it stays circulating in the blood all the time. It's good if it gets into your muscles. There's outside the door here, there's a marathon runner. All those marathon runners were carbo-loading in the weeks leading up to the race. They were eating pasta and rice and bread and potatoes, getting sugar into their liver and into their muscles to power them for a race. Okay, so glucose is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. But to get into the cell, it has to go through those funny little purple doorways, which are closed. To get in, you need a hormone called insulin that's just like a key. And that insulin key attaches to that red receptor, like a key in a lock. And when it does, it opens those channels, and in comes the glucose. Very easy. So if a person has type 2 diabetes, they've got glucose, they've got insulin, they've got receptors, they've got everything. 
what's not working right? Something inside the cell. And what is that? Those yellow blobs. That's chicken fat. Beef fat. That's salmon fat. That's fryer grease. That's olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil. Extra, extra virgin olive oil. All those yellow blobs are fat that came in the foods that we eat. Now, doctors hate words like fat because it only has three letters. So we would prefer to call it <coughs> intramyocellular. <laughs> <laughs> Intra means inside. Myo means muscle. <coughs> cellular means cellular. And lipid means fat. Intramyocellular lipid is fat building up inside each muscle cell. Now, picture this. You can be a skinny person. But inside the individual muscle cells are fat particles that stop insulin from working. With me? So the more, it, it, if you had chewing gum inside a lock, your key can be a perfectly good key, but you can't open the lock. You've got fat inside the muscles, insulin can't do its job. That's the reason why people get insulin resistant, and that's where the diabetes comes from. And that is why when a person imagines that they got diabetes from eating sugar or eating bread, Right? Too many potatoes, and they stop eating that, their diabetes doesn't go away. Because that was never the problem. The problem was the buildup of fat inside their cells. And if a doctor sits down with a patient and says, I want you to stop eating carbohydrate, they will guarantee that that patient is going to have diabetes for the rest of their life. And they're going to be on medication. They're not going to get better because you're not telling them what caused it. So, at Yale University, we've been working with Jerry Shulman and Kit Peterson and their team. And they did a fascinating study of young people. They brought in 26 people. They were all young. And they did a glucose tolerance test. That's where you feed people this little glass of syrup. And they drink down all the sugar. And then some of them turned out to be insulin sensitive, meaning that sugar went into the blood and went right out because their insulin could do a good job. But the others were insulin resistant. And the insulin resistant ones, they <coughs> drank the sugary syrup. And the sugar couldn't get into their cells, so you could measure if their blood sugar stayed high. So then they took these people and they described them. Those who are insulin sensitive, we're going to call them the control, the healthy ones. On average, 28 years old, insulin resistant ones, 26. Uh, their weight, pretty thin, healthy folks. And their A1Cs were in the totally normal range. Nobody had diabetes. They then put them into a magnetic resonance scanner. Uh, if you ever had an MRI, um, you can look into the brain, you can look into the ankles and the knees and any part you want. What they were looking at was the muscles and the liver. And looking at how much fat had built up. And each dot here is a person. So this is how much fat, intramyocellular lipid, how much fat is in their muscles. That's the, these are the control. These are the ones who are insulin resistant. So they got more fat in their muscles. Now, this is their mitochondrial activity. Remember from high school biology, your, your mitochondria are those little burners inside your cells that give you energy. Well, they don't like living in a fatty oil slip. So here's the control. There's the insulin sensitive people. Now, keep in mind, these people are young, thin, and nobody has diabetes. But they have habituated to diets that have a fair amount of fat in them. And so some of them are already starting to build up fat inside their cells, right there, and their mitochondria are, not, are misfiring, so that means they're going to be starting to gain weight as time goes on. They're going to be diagnosed with diabetes, not for another 15 or 20 or 25 years, but the disease process has started. So the point is, there are young, healthy people. They may even be athletic. They have no idea that in 20 years' time, they're going to get the disease manifesting that's starting now. And if that person says, I'm going to change my diet for health, for animals, for the environment, whatever it is, they can turn this disease around without ever knowing that it was in their future. Now I'd like to talk to you about your car insurance. Um, <laughs> Geico is one of the United States' biggest car insurance companies. And its national headquarters happens to be four blocks from my office. And so back in about 2006, I got to talking to their health director, who said, we need your help. I've got a lot of people here who are on insulin for diabetes, they're overweight, we need to do a study at, at Geico. And so what we did is we uh, talked to the cafeteria manager. We said, let's serve completely vegan foods in the cafeteria for anybody who wants them. And let's have a weekly support group for anybody who's deciding they're going to do it. 
And so we had a large group of people who said, I'll volunteer, I want to do this. 18 weeks, we're all going to go vegan together. And I have to say for the cafeteria manager, um, he meant well, but um, he got a little confused. However, <laughs> they figured it out, and uh, the individuals who went, went on it, yes, take off the bacon, cheese. Um, they figured it out, and it turned out that people lost weight very well. If they had diabetes, they got dramatically better. So we did the study again in 10 different U.S. cities at GEICO headquarters in Macon, Georgia, in Dallas, Texas, in Buffalo, New York, in San Diego, California, all over the place. And if people were overweight, they lost weight very well. If they had diabetes, they got better. And I have to tell you, on a personal level, our, after our first study, our, our uh, instructors would come back to the office. And they would say, those people at GEICO, they are great. They are so motivated, they are so enthusiastic, they are such good participants. Except for two of them. There's two, there's Hillary and Bruce, they come each week, and they just misbehave so badly. They sit in the back of the room, and they just chatter constantly to each other, and they're passing notes back and forth, and they're distracting all the other participants. I wish they just would not come. And every week I kept hearing how bad Hillary and Bruce were. Um, but I discovered something. You can misjudge people. And our instructors misjudged Hillary and Bruce. So the, yes, they were chattering a lot, and they were distracting everybody else. However, um, what they were chattering about was they were making their shopping list, and they were making their notes from each week and passing it back and forth. And they were planning their vegan Thanksgiving dinner for all their friends. And they were conspiring how to figure out how to make her parents go vegan with them. And they were actually very motivated. And a year later, Bruce sent me this picture. That, Hillary's lost 85 pounds, Bruce has lost 100 pounds, and he told me something. He said, you know, when we were really heavy, we didn't want to be heavy, we tried all kinds of diets. And you try a diet, and pretty soon you discover that you are not the success story you saw on TV. <laughs> it looks so easy for them, it's not easy for me. There's got to be something wrong with me. And you try another diet, and again, it's hard. It's harder than you thought. It's got to be me. I'm the failure here. And that leads into other aspects of your life. I'm probably not a very great employee. I'm sure you can find somebody better than me. And I'm probably not a very good spouse or a good father or whatever the heck it is. And then you realize, it's not you at all. This is a diet that somebody pushed on you that has nothing to do with your physiology. And suddenly you're realizing, I am built for vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans, and they nourish my health, and I can accommodate to this. And once I get into this and I succeed, that spreads into other aspects of your life. I can do stuff. I can succeed at all kinds of things. And after they lost all this weight, they, they started exploring other things that they do. They discovered they loved exercise, and they shot this picture the day they ran their first half marathon. Um, so a healthy diet, fruits and grains and legumes and vegetables, when you share this with your friends, they're all going to raise a question with you, which is, <laughs> hey, like, where do you get your protein? And I know this gives you a headache. Um, it always amazes me that, that in, in um, observational trials, uh, vegans have less depression than any other diet group. I don't know why, because you ask, get asked nudgy questions all the time by other people. It should give you a big headache. But anyway, uh, let's walk through the numbers. Uh, according to the US government uh, and other governments, women should have about 46 grams of protein per day, on average. And for men, about 56. A little bit more if you're bigger and more athletic, but that's the kind of So when I was growing up in Fargo, North Dakota, our idea of eating was meat gave you the protein. And vegetables gave you vitamins, and starch gave you calories. And so if you took away the meat, where, where, do, where do you get your protein? Well, what if I ate vegetables? Just vegetables. Would I get protein from that? In fact, what if I ate nothing but broccoli? Um, not that you would do this, but as an experiment, you eat probably roughly, roughly 2,000 calories in a day is what a, a person might eat. And if I ate 2,000 calories of just just broccoli, I would get 146 grams of pure protein. In other words, the 46 you might need plus 100. 
The next day, I'm going to do it, this experiment again. I'm going to eat only lentil. Just, just lentil. 2,000 calories worth. I'm now getting 157 grams of pure protein. Hopefully, you're not eating just broccoli or just lentils. But the point is, if you eat plant foods, they have protein in them. Lots of protein. And you eat any normal mixture of these, you get all the essential amino acids you need to make all the protein you could ever want, including if, if you're a top athlete. You get plenty of protein, complete non-issue. Okay? So the next question comes up, what about calcium? Cows give us calcium in milk. Okay, cows don't make calcium. Calcium is an element. It's in the earth. And the calcium passes through the roots of grass into the grass. The cow eats the grass. Some of the calcium gets in the milk. If you drink that, you absorb about 32% of it. The other 68% goes into the toilet. That's the physiology of it. So what nature thought you were going to do was eat green leafy vegetables yourself. Um, hopefully not grass. But if you eat typical green leafy vegetables, they have a lot of calcium. It came from the earth, went through the roots, got it's in there the green part of the vegetable. And it's highly absorbable. The calcium absorption from broccoli, its absorption rate is about double that for cow's milk, or Brussels sprouts, or the other green leafy vegetables. Now, spinach, I put in parentheses, it has a lot of calcium, but it's poorly absorbed due to spinach's selfish nature. But um, for the other green leafy vegetables, it's, um, it's uh, very highly absorbed. Now, vitamin B12 is something that you need for healthy nerves and healthy blood. <coughs> And the amount you need is minimal, 2.4 micrograms. And B12 is an interesting thing. It's not made by plants or by animals. It's made by bacteria. And many people will say that prior to the advent of modern hygiene, the bacteria in the soil or on plants or in our mouths or on our fingers would give us that 2.4 micrograms we need. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But in the world of modern hygiene, that is definitely not true. So you should supplement vitamin B12. And this is true for vegans, but it's also true, frankly, for everybody else. If you go into a hematology clinic, the people who are vitamin B12 deficient, there might be the occasional vegan there, but they're mostly meat eaters who are low in B12. And the reason that they're low in B12 is because they were diagnosed with diabetes and they were put on metformin, which interferes with B12 absorption, or they're on an acid blocker, which means they can't break the B12 off protein anymore, or they're just not making much stomach acid or, or for whatever reason. So I encourage everybody to supplement. It's in every multiple vitamin pill, or you can just go to any pharmacy or any health food store and get a B12 pill, get the smallest one that they sell, and that, that's, that's it. Okay? Um, all right. So some folks nowadays are doing low-carbohydrate <laughs> diets. Uh, they're going ketogenic. And they're losing weight, and they're saying, wow, this is fantastic, everybody ought to do it. Um, it doesn't last long for many of them, but they get very enthusiastic for about 10 or 12 days. But um, <laughs> let's, let's, let's go through this a little bit. It is true that you can lose weight on a low-carbohydrate diet, and you can lose, car lose weight on many, many different diets. But the danger of a low-carbohydrate diet is what's left behind when you take all the carbohydrate out. Carbohydrates in beans or fruit or grains, that's about half of what people eat, or maybe even 60%. And if you take all of that out, you're, you're going to lose weight. If, if you take out any 50 or 60% of what you eat, you will lose weight. But what it often leaves behind is meat and butter, and those foods are very high in saturated fat, and many animal foods have cholesterol as well. So uh, there was a, long, a fairly large study of people on a ketogenic diet and after a year, they noticed that their LDL cholesterol had risen by uh, about 10, 10 points. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with LDL. That's bad cholesterol. That's the one that means heart attack is in your future. And this is not a good thing. They, these are people who had diabetes. They wanted to lose weight. They wanted to get healthy. But their cholesterol was getting worse on that. The reason that's a problem is that what kills a person with diabetes is not a high blood sugar. What kills a person with diabetes is heart disease. And you just made their heart disease worse by, with this low, uh, low ketogen, uh, this ketogenic diet. Um, now normally, when you lose weight, your cholesterol level will fall. Just a smaller body has less cholesterol. So this is work done by Gary Foster in Pennsylvania. And he put people on a low calorie diet, just a typical starvation diet. 
and their, their LDL cholesterol fell. But he also put people on a low-carb diet, and their LDL rose. Uh-oh, that's not supposed to happen. And then as time went on, they got sick of the diet, and they started cheating on it, and what they discovered is they got back more where they started. But to avoid carbohydrates and to eat lots of meat is not good for your heart. Okay? Now, by the way, this was not the first time this was shown. The Atkins <coughs> Foundation funded researchers at Duke University, um, and they put them on this diet for just six months. And they found that many of them did lose weight, and so as they lost weight, their cholesterol did fall. That's what's supposed to happen. But about 29% of them had their LDL cholesterols go up, and in some cases, they went up wildly. They did another study, also six months, uh, about 30% of people had these wild increases in LDL, and in some cases, they just go off the scale. So not a good thing to do. Um, so researchers will then say, okay, well, wait a minute. Um, to get more sophisticated, yes, 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 your bad cholesterol will rise for a lot of people on a ketogenic diet. But we could say that those LDL particles are the big particles. And this will not be on the test. This is for extra credit. Um, <laughs> LDL comes in different varieties. Some of them are big, fluffy LDL particles. Those are thought to be innocuous had been thought to be innocuous, and some of them are small, beady-eyed little LDL particles that are bad for you. But researchers have looked at this and found that if you have extra small LDL particles, what these numbers mean is that your risk of cardiovascular problems is increased by 63%. But the small ones increase your risk by 44%, so they're not innocuous. They're just not as bad as the small ones. Here's what I'm getting that no matter what happens, if your LDL bad cholesterol rises, that is bad, no matter what excuses people make for it. And ketogenic diets do that quite routinely in a very large number of people. A dangerous diet to follow, and a terrible diet to promote to the public. Okay? Now, um, regardless of size, LDL particles are atherogenic. How's hard to do? And then some people will say, they look at their blood tests and they say, but wait, my good cholesterol, that's HDL, that went up on this seemingly terrible diet. And that is true. Uh, when people go on, on some different diets, sometimes their HDL, or so-called good cholesterol, rises. However, our disappointed ketogenic friends have come to realize that that doesn't help them. HDL does not seem to help. Um, when we look at high HDL levels, whether you get there by a diet change or by medication that raise HDL, they have no cardioprotective effect. So raising that HDL doesn't affect them at all, okay? So, um, bottom line, researchers are now coming to think that when you get your cholesterol test, look at that LDL level. You want it low. You don't want it to come up at all, and a high HDL will not excuse it. Okay, make any sense? All right, okay. So, starting a helpful diet. Um, this sounds great. Maybe I could reverse my diabetes. Maybe I could lose some weight, but how the heck am I going to do this? Going to a vegan diet, I mean, I don't even like folk music. How am I going to do this? <laughs> you know? So anyway, um, all of our participants who come into our research studies or into our clinic ask these same questions. And we break the change into two steps, and I've never seen anyone unable to do it. So if you're not there yet, here are the two steps. And let me encourage you to try this today. In four weeks, your life is going to be completely transformed. Step one, you check out the possibilities. What I mean is, don't get anything out of your diet yet. All you're going to do is check out what you could eat. So take a piece of paper, and we write all the different meals on it. And my assignment to you is seven days from now, have filled out that piece of paper with things you think you might like to eat that happen to be vegan, that, that you really like. Okay, so um, let's see. Every day I have milk on my cereal. Could I use almond milk? I don't know. Is that any good? you got seven days. Try it. Um, or... Gee, you know, if I, I've never had the veggie sausage. Is that any good? If, if you don't want to eat that, skip it. But, but try the things you might want to try. And if you like it, write it down on the list. And then you do the same thing for lunch. Can I have a pizza without cheese? I don't know. Maybe that's okay. I mean, try it. So you've got seven days. You're trying these things. And not just at home, but when you go out to a restaurant. Try the Italian place. Can they make you an angel hair pasta with a rabiata sauce? See what you think. Um, or, let's see, maybe I could go to Latin American. Veggie fajitas and bean burritos and beans and rice, and if you like it, on the list. And then you discover Chinese restaurants have about 
three dozen things that work, rice dishes and tofu dishes and every kind of vegetable and so forth. Um, and even a sushi bar. They say, vegan sushi, of course. We've got cucumber rolls, asparagus rolls, sweet potato rolls. What do you want? Miso soup, seaweed salad, write them down. Subway, more than happy to leave the cheese and meat off your sandwich. Taco Bell is not the pinnacle of culinary art, but they'll make you a <laughs> bean burrito. Uh, okay, so seven days later, you got your list. That was easy. That was step one. Now, step two, we are going to do a test drive. For the next three weeks, you're going to be vegan. No animal products for three weeks. But that's easy because it's only three weeks. And also, you've already figured out what you're going to eat. And it's simple. So now you stock up on all the things that you know you like and just do it for 21 days. At the end of that period of time, two things happen. The first is you're physically transforming. You're losing weight. If you have diabetes, your blood sugar is starting to fall. And by the way, if you do have diabetes and you do this, Make sure your doctor knows that you're making a diet change because this diet change is powerful. Your insulin sensitivity can be restored so rapidly that your doctor has to take you off your insulin or start cutting it down or self inhibitory drugs because otherwise the combination of this very powerful dietary change and the powerful drugs that you're injecting can leave you with too low blood sugar. So this is, this is serious stuff. Um, you can lose weight, your blood sugar has improved, your digestion is sorting out, you're mentally feeling better. If you're an athlete, gee, I don't hurt so much after my athletics, so my skin's clearing up, whatever. Um, so the first thing are physical changes, but the other thing is you discover that your tastes are adapting. You find that you're discovering cool things that you like, and that vegetables look more appealing than they did before, and you thought you couldn't live without roast beef or pork chop or something like that, and you discover, I don't care about that so much. But just kind of let that happen. And we have lots of tools for you. Um, we have our kick, uh, Kickstart Your Health program. If you go on your iPhone or your Android, 21 Day Vegan Kickstart, free download, videos, menus, recipes, all kinds of stuff, and it will walk you through 21 days. Uh, we're not selling anything, there's no commercial sponsorship. Um, just this 21 Day Vegan Kickstart on your phone. Um, and you will love it. Um, if you are a health professional, or even if you're not, if you want, you can download our nutrition guide for clinicians. Uh, we're not selling anything. It's totally free. It's, there's no commercial sponsorship. Nutrition guide for clinicians. You can look up how nutrition affects Alzheimer's or varicose vein or whatever the case may be. It's all there. Um, also for caregivers, nutrition CME. Uh, that stands for Continuing <coughs> Medical Education. It's all free. Uh, not selling drugs. It's, uh, it's all nutrition. Um, and if any of you would like to come visit us in Washington, when we are at our most sweltering, every summer we have our, our International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine, and we love to have it. Um, let me finish off, though, by, I'd like to talk about something that was in the news a little bit. Did you see this headline that said, you don't have to reduce meat? You see this? Meat's actually okay for you, including sausage. Who would have thought it? It was just a couple of years ago that the World Health Organization said it's a group one carcinogen. Sausage and bacon and all the processed meats cause colon and cancer. Why did the headlines now say, you can eat all you want, you don't have to reduce it at all? What's that about? Did that leave you confused? Let's go through it. What happened was, the Annals of Internal Medicine published six articles by one research group. Uh, it was run by a guy named Brad Johnston in Canada. And how he convinced the Annals to do this, I don't know. But um, the first four, four of the six studies were meta-analyses. And a meta-analysis is nothing new. You just take old research and you analyze the results in a new way. And so they looked at what happens if you don't stop eating meat, but just reduce it. And what they found is that people who eat low-meat diets have 13% less risk of all-cause mortality, dying of anything, less risk of cardiovascular mortality, less risk of non-fatal stroke, less risk of diabetes, less risk of developing cancer, or dying of it. And all of these findings were statistically significant, meaning there was a less than 1 in 20 chance that this was just a random finding. This was real. And the other studies showed more or less the same thing. But then they did a fifth study which said, how do meat eaters feel about eating meat? And they interviewed them, and they, the meat eaters said, well, gee, um, I like meat. And plus, some of them said, I think I need meat for protein. <laughs> and so this is what they wrote. Oh, sorry. 
meat eaters enjoy eating meat and consider it an essential component of a healthy diet. So they published a sixth paper where I'm not making this up. They had a panel of Bradley Johnson himself, a PhD student, three people who admitted they knew nothing whatsoever about nutrition or health, but were put on this panel, I'm not making this up, and others, all of whom were meat eaters. And they asked them to decide what people should eat. Yes, and here's what they concluded. For the majority of individuals, the desirable effects of potentially lowered risk for cancer and cardiometabolic outcomes associated with reducing meat consumption probably do not outweigh the undesirable effect, the impact on your quality of life, the burden of modifying cultural and personal meal preparation and eating habits. In other words, it's just not worth it. Now, wait a minute. Here's a reality check. These are not new guidelines. This is just Bradley Johnson's idea that he convinced the Annals of Internal Medicine to publish. And even he found that it's a good idea to reduce meat. And he didn't even test, what if you stop eating it altogether? What if you go vegan? What if you don't have diabetes anymore? Is that maybe a good idea? Um, and if this sounds familiar, in 2017, the Annals published a similar article that exonerated sugar. Sugar is fine. And it was by Bradley Johnson. <laughs> and it turned out that it was funded by the International Life Sciences Institute, which is funded by McDonald's and the other various uh, fast food and big food chains. And in 2014, the very same journal published an article saying that saturated fat is okay, and they put on the, uh, Time Magazine thought this was great, and put this swirl of butter on the cover, eat butter. So apparently, the reason that we have weight problems and diabetes and heart disease has nothing to do with cheese or maybe or sugar or food, or it's all genetic, or it's something in the air, or it's bad karma, or whatever it is. Wait a minute, we need a reality check. And this has been really terrible, the Wall Street Journal published this just the other day, saying, Ha, 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 all you people who said that meat's a problem, we need all the steak we want. And don't push your liberal ideas on us about climate change either. This has been the most destructive thing. I have to say, the animals made a mistake. The animals of internal medicine should have sent this, these papers back to him and said, rethink this a little bit. Look at the evidence and come back to us when you finish. Because what they did do is they sent around a press release to all the press outlets in the world, the major press outlets, and they all ran these headlines. They never read the reports. And we read the law. And uh, setting up something that actually, under U.S. law, constitutes advertising. And the idea they promoted was false, so we went to the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Um, and they have our, our complaint pending right now against the Animal, uh, Internal Medicine for publishing a false idea. Now, that sounds far-fetched that we would do that. But the U.S. dairy industry, a number of years ago, was actually uh, publishing advertisements saying that if you were on a low, if you were trying to lose weight, but it included dairy in your diet, you would lose more weight than if you were on a low-calorie diet without the dairy. That was a false claim. It was not true. So we went to the Federal Trade Commission. They said, you're right. They shut down the dairy industry from ever making an advertisement. We've asked the analysts to say, okay, figure it out. Let's get back to reality. It means not such a healthy thing for you. The last thing that I just want to say is I want to first thank the organizers for bringing today together. This is going to be a very rich day of great information. But I also want to thank all of you for taking time out of your schedules to come here. Uh, the people who need this message the most are not in this room. They're 12 years old. They're watching television. They're seeing commercials for all kinds of things. They're eating foods in school that over the long run are going to lead to diabetes and heart problems and weight problems. They're going to blame themselves. They're going to think it was, I, was, I wasn't exercising enough. They're going to think all kinds of rubbish things. But you're going to know, fa know important things that you will share with your friends, with your loved ones. You're going to put them on social media. You'll never know how many lives you're going to change, but I guarantee you'll change many. Thank you so much for listening.